As a photojournalist during the 60s and 70s, my photographs appeared in major magazines such as Life, Paris Match and Stern. In this video, I'll be telling you all about the cameras I used, show you the photographs I took and explain the technical problems that had to be overcome in order to capture them. This week, I want to tell you about the first photo essay I ever shot. More than a half a century ago, the photo essay was a popular form of photojournalism, especially with European magazine editors. The idea here was to tell a story using as many photographs, but as few words as possible. My chosen subject for this photo essay was the working life of the fishermen of England, the men and teenagers who were then working in the flourishing trawler industry. Now, in my previous video, I dated this assignment at around 1964. However, looking back at my diaries for the period, I see I actually went on the assignment in March 1960, when I was still in my final year, my final term indeed, at the Regent Street School of Photography, part of the Regent Street Polytechnic. To arrange my trip with the Fishermen of England, I wrote to McFisheries, which was then the UK's largest high street fish retailer, and I asked if I could accompany one of their crews to photograph the life in the North Sea during the notoriously stormy month of March, when I thought I might get some really exciting pictures. They agreed and offered me a berth aboard one of their trawlers, the Ocean Surf. This sailed from the fishing harbour of Lowestoft on the east coast of England and was destined to be away from port for around about three weeks, so it was quite a long trip. Being a hard up student, my budget for a camera to use on this challenging and a potentially hazardous assignment was somewhat limited. I couldn't afford, for example, the Nikons, which I, which I later relied on for my professional career. In the end, I chose this camera, which is a Miranda. This is a Japanese single lens reflex with interchangeable lenses and also interchangeable prisms. So let's take a closer look at this nice little camera. You can see their shutter speeds from one second to a thousandth of a second, plus bulb. This is when the shutter will stay open until you, the photographer decides to release it by pressing the, the shutter button again. You see it's a very robust little camera with a nice smoothly operating shutter. Now the Miranda was produced in Japan between 1955 and 1978 and as you can see it's a it's a very sturdy little camera and indeed it worked absolutely perfectly throughout my three-way trip surviving perfectly the conditions of, of a storm ravaged ocean i arrived at Lowestoft the night before we were due to depart and i spent my first rather uncomfortable night i have to say sleeping on my own in the trawler's small aft cabin where there were bunk beds fitted to the walls of the cabin uh, for all of the crew. There was a table in the middle where they ate their meals and a coke stove which, as I will explain, was kept blazing away throughout the voyage. The following morning, as you will see in the video, our first task was to take on ice because in those days the trawlers were completely unrefrigerated and the only way to keep the fish fresh was by packing them in ice. The crew arrived over the next hour or so, including our skipper, Andy, and our Scots engineer, known only by the name of Jock. Joe, the cook, then turned up, as always smoking a tatty roll-up, which remained locked between his lips throughout the voyage, even while he was preparing the copious amounts of food the crew somehow managed to eat. Food which often reached the aft cabin where they, were, where they had their meals reached the cabin smeared with a layer of a grey cigarette ash. It took us about a day to steam steadily to the fishing grounds of the Dogger Bank. 
added a skipper navigated using charts and what was called a Decker navigator. In the days before satellite navigation, this system developed for the D-Day landings was the only reliable way to know your position at sea. The Decker navigator operated by detecting signals sent out from several fixed land-based stations and these signals were used to, to find your position when you were away from land. One thing which really surprised me was how noisy our entire trip was. I suppose in my naive way I'd believe that surrounded by the sea and the sky it was going to be a relatively quiet experience. Well it was anything but. 24 hours a day for nearly three weeks there was the constant hammering sound of the trawler's powerful diesel engines. Then there was the noise of the waves hammering on the metal hull and the cries of hundreds of seabirds which circled the ship in the hope of free food each time we raised the nets. Around every four hours they would haul in their nets, discard the unwanted catch, which seemed to consist mostly of starfish, gut the fish they were keeping and then pack them away in the ice-filled holes. This went on around the clock for the next 17 days or so. Between times of lowering the nets and hauling them in, the crews would catch what sleep they could, eat vast quantities of food in the siphonly hot aft cabin, where, as I explained, there was a coke stove which was constantly kept burning. Or they would be up on deck in the rain and the wind and the storms, repairing the net. They were a wonderful group of people, some of the nicest people I've ever met. And they lived a hard, arduous life, which was certainly not for the faint-hearted. Working on the narrow, machine-crowded decks, which were slippery with fish scales and seawater, was hazardous in the extreme. I vividly remember how a, a new teenage member of the crew, he must have been about 18, what is called a decky in trawling terms, a boy called Martin, slipped on several occasions, took hard tumbles while they were casting out the nets. His, well, his rubber boots simply slid on the fish uh, slick decks uh, and he f fell on his back. I actually caught one of these falls on camera as you will see in the video. In March on the Dogger Bank, as any sailors among you will know, there is seldom less than a force 5 wind which means for the uninitiated winds of between 22 and 34 miles per hour, certainly quite strong enough to stir the seas in what the fishermen used to term lumpy. My Miranda camera behaves perfectly throughout the voyage and I managed to shoot some 800 rolls of 36 exposure 35mm film, often under extremely difficult conditions. Not only were the decks heaving and, and making it hard to frame your shots, but in the pitching aft cabin where the men ate and slept, light levels were fairly low, and so I often had to struggle to find a combination of the f-stop, the aperture, and the shutter speed that I would need to correctly expose the negative. In his very popular song, The Fisherman of England, composer Montague Fawcett Williams described how in tiny vessels they defy the perils of the deep and scan the water's dreary wastes with eyes that never sleep. I was soon to discover just how true those lines were.
Thank you so much for watching. Next week we'll be taking the plunge to the Mediterranean and I'll show you the photographs I took during a unique expedition run by two London universities to build and live in an underwater house five fathom down in Paradise Bay, Malta. If you'd like to see some more of my photographs, please go to www.thewayitwas.uk If you'd like to purchase a copy of my book, The Way It Was, then please go to the same website and take a look at what it contains. If you lived through the 60s, it will bring back some memories. If you never lived through the 60s, you'll find a foreign country where they do things very different.